Op 15 en 16 januari is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar weer in Nederland. Hij geeft dan een workshop via dit to- telefoonnummer 6820206 in Amsterdam. Kunt u zich daarvoor aanmelden. We laten nu een interview en een gedeelte van een lezing zien van vorig jaar toen Sri Sri Ravi Shankar ook in Nederland was in het Tropeninstituut. Sri Sri op Kleurnet. How can I cope with a mind that is occupied with sex? Why sex is so enjoyable? Because sex brings your mind and body and breath all together in the present moment. The ancient rishis measured the love or the bliss in terms of sex. They said one moment of meditation is equivalent to one thousand times of joy you get in sex. They said, Sahasrarati, one thousand times of the pleasure of sex is equivalent to one moment of deep samadhi meditation. When you know that there are ways to transform the prana, the life force in you, into more higher values like love, compassion and bliss, joy, it's the same energy which as sex becomes love or joy, can be transformed. And through pranayam, through meditation, you can take out this preoccupation in your mind. I wouldn't uh, say this to the teenagers, For teenagers, I would say, you just grow up. But when you are grown up and when you have experienced the sex and gone through over it, and you see, it is very charming to begin with, but later on it leaves you empty-handed. Just depleted and not so high in spirit. Then I would say, okay, you have experienced this Zena, but now you go a little higher. And here, you see the same energy which is manifesting as sex starts manifesting as love, as joy, as bliss. Hmm? Just think. Yeah? Is um, anything really negative or is pain just a teacher? Huh? Is um, anything really negative or is pain just a teacher? Is there anything negative? Yeah, is um, anything really negative or do we just look at things as negative and we must learn from it? Is there anything really negative? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is like the creases in the cloth. Creases. It's a knot in the cloth. But does the knot really exist? No. You just iron the knot out and it doesn't exist. It's like the darkness. Do darkness exist? Yes and no. 
darkness doesn't exist as a substance, but it is simply lack of light. Sri Ravi Shankar, who is the principal teacher in a movement called the Art of Living. What made you bring your message to the West? See, wisdom does not belong to any country or place or province. It belongs to the entire mankind. So the knowledge which would uplift human values is a property of the whole humanity. And the message that you're bringing to the West uh, has to do with human values and... That's right, human values. See, today, um, after 50 years of human rights and all that talk, still human values have not been attended. No? And only spiritual upliftment can bring the human values in time. In the West, we've so often sought our happiness through material objects, through the acquisition of one thing or another. Uh, how is your system bringing happiness or in greater human uh, uh, happiness? You see, half the wealth, half of our health we spend to bring get wealth, and then half of our wealth we spend back to get back the health. So we, life we need to have a balance. Wealth is a means, but the goal is human evolution. So um, being materialistic is not any way contrary to growing spiritual. You can have material prosperity, but have a balance. Value the life, value the spirit that is within you. That is most important, isn't it? <laughs> now, we're so busy here in the West, uh, maintaining our lifestyle, and can the average person expect to find enlightenment or, or find a path uh, towards enlightenment? Definitely. Only a common per man can find. If someone thinks they are special, they are far from enlightenment. <laughs> enlightenment comes to someone who feels simple, common, and who lives a very you know, contented life. Contented doesn't seem to be a, a word I would describe the West with uh, in this day and age. Is it is there a special formula for finding this contentment that comes within your uh, your teaching? Yeah, definitely, you know. 
when your mind is whole, when you have the connection with the innermost of yourself, then contentment comes. Because all these virtues like contentment, love, is your very nature. So you don't have to go somewhere to find it. It's right there with you. Now I understand that in your teaching there is a, a, a formulation of breathing or a manner that, uh, that you teach. Could you explain that a little bit to me? See, there is a rhythm in nature, right? The seasons come in time and there is winter and then spring comes and then summer. So there is a particular rhythm in the nature. In the same way there is a rhythm in our body. There is a biorhythm. You feel like sleeping and then you feel hungry and then you feel thirsty. All this natural cycle happens. In the same way there is a rhythm in our breath. And there is a rhythm in our mind, in our thought patterns. And there is a rhythm in our emotions. So when a harmony is brought between all these rhythms in existence, you experience what is called bliss. And for which everyone is hankering, everyone is looking for it. So this happens through simple breathing techniques and meditations. We put together a number of small, simple techniques which people can use in their day-to-day -day life. Because one gets angry, agitated, frustrated, sad, depressed. What to do? You know, instead of taking pills and getting over your depression, you can take recourse in your own breath and meditation. That relieves you of all these negative feelings and leaves you freedom from within. Now I understand that you've taken this message in a very practical manner to the prisons and places like that. Uh, is this part of the teaching? Right. Uh, you know, meditation is seeing the love within you and expression of it outside in the worldly service. So we have uh, many, many service projects around the world for poor children who need support and prisoners around the world. You know what happens with the prisoners is they are stuck there with all these negative feelings, anger, rage, and they don't know how to get it out of their system. Neither in school nor at home anyone teaches how to deal with our negativities. So that is where this has become so very useful and popular around the world. So that one can get rid of all this negativity and feel fresh and new every day. Now, as part of this service, I've also read somewhere that you were active in helping terminal AIDS patients. Yeah, we have started program for AIDS and cancer and uh, also juvenile delinquent people and MS, you know, multiple sclerosis. In Slovenia we had some research done on that. It is very, very useful in many, many of those illnesses, blood pressure. And, and this is primarily through the, the breath method and the right. meditation. Right. Breath and meditation. Now, I, I think somewhere also I saw that you advocated uh, silence. Uh. Right. This is another aspect of, you know, I usually recommend people to take one week of silence in a year. Minimum one week. You know, that rejuvenates. Silence brings together all different uh, faculty of our mind and puts us right in our own space. <laughs> it gives such a lot of energy and wisdom. Could we, you? I usually conduct a pro retreats for a, for a week long retreats, uh, in which people come from all over the place, different places, and stay there and align themselves with nature, 
you know, they wake up and do some exercise, right amount of food and meditation and some some singing and so they feel so elevated and so charged. How many people do you have now uh, that are part of, uh, do you call them adepts or wh wh is there a term for them? Well, I have not kept a record but there are many, many, th thousands and hundreds and some thousands. Now, I have spent a year in India and I, there are a number of, it's a very spiritual place, incredibly spiritual compared to the West and uh, I've always been curious as to how one like yourself would come to your work. Is it a calling or did you know early in your life or when exactly did it happen? Yeah, I knew. <laughs> I used to tell when I was in school that I have family around the world, I'm going all over the world. <laughs> Was there a moment that it all came together for you? In 82, I took a 10-day silence. Afterwards, then I started giving these teaching courses all over the place. Do you still maintain a, a presence in India, or is it just in the West that you're now working? Oh, in India, yes. Every part of India, yes. every corner of India, all over. <laughs> our main headquarters is in India. In Bangalore, we have our headquarters, and every province there are um, teachers who are teaching, and I visit once a year. Hmm. And at this point, you're visiting the various centers in the West that uh, that and bringing the message. Uh, this evening, you're going to have a talk. Uh, what will you be presenting to the people? I usually don't plan what I will present, you know. I'm just there available and people ask some questions and I just answer them. <laughs> I understand that there's a, uh, that you're working with women's rights in India. Uh, and I know that when I was there it seemed that women still have a very difficult time there in India. And how are you helping them? We have started many vocational training centers for women so that they can become self-sufficient. We teach them tailoring and other skills, you know, cottage uh, industry skills. And so they, they are on their own, then they can earn their livelihood. Mm -hmm. And edu educate them in health and hygiene. And we started s schools in many rural um, villages, rural areas. That has helped many people. Now, I've asked people that I've met in my life that are uh, spiritual leaders about love. What do you feel love is and how do we come to it? <laughs> love is what you are. <laughs> you are made up of a substance called love. It's due to tension and ignorance that love gets covered, lack of understanding. So once the tensions are released and you feel free from within and prayerful, then you find it's all love. And in your movement, I believe there are an emphasis on grace and uh, serenity and how do we achieve in this busy world right now uh, a state of grace? See, um, grace comes with gratitude. How grateful are you in your life? That much grace you receive more. You know there is a quote in Bible that says, those who have will be given more, those who do not have, whatever they have will also be taken away. It simply means that, you know, when you feel that gratefulness for all that you have, more grace flows. <laughs> and I know that in my own life I, I feel a lot of 
oftentimes a lot of stress and a lot of uh, inability to to cope with everyday life. Is there are there methods that you recommend for uh, the average man? Definitely, you know, uh, see your life from a bigger context. Have a big picture of your life. That's number one. Uh, second thing is you can do some breathing exercises, breathing techniques. Third is you can sit and do some meditation, few minutes of meditation, morning, evening. And then spending some time with nature, take a good walk in nature, look at the sunset, and do some very insignificant things like, you know, just go and attend to the grass, and or just sit under the tree and count the leaves, <laughs> or, you know, do something which is not so rational. You know, stress often comes from rational part of our mind. Listening to music, singing, dancing, spending time in arts, all these can reduce stress. Now do of, of this all, I would uh, really say breath would be the most easiest and important thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Do you um, have forms of exercise that uh, might help out? Uh. Yeah, definitely. We have trained many, many teachers around the world who would guide them for over a weekend, you know, four days, three days, couple of hours, and then people can do it on their own. Now, you have centers all over India. Where else in the world do you have centers? It's many countries. About 95 countries around the world now we have centers. And these centers uh, provide training and... Training, and help and service projects. They all take up service projects. Do some community service. And of course they start teaching there and train teachers in every area. So those who get help and then they pass on to others who need help. <laughs> how do we how do we express our spiritual self in life? You only have to wake up and see it's everything is part of the spirit and spiritual self is expressing itself. It only needs a vision. There is no effort, you don't have to make an effort to express your spiritual self. It is there. Now, many teachers um, bring a message to the West from the East. Is this for some special reason? See, it's one world today. West is not West anymore. East is not East anymore. Today, you see, West and East has become almost the same. You see, any town in the East is uh, metropolitan cities, especially. It's as good as any Western cities now. I see the globe is one, one world, one people. Yeah, the way people dress, their languages are different, but those are all on the periphery, it's all. But basically human beings are seeing. <laughs> and in need of something, there seems to be a, a great searching going on right now in the world, and uh, what can we do? And that's, that's good, you know, that's, that's very good. People are waking up to the reality that there is something more than bread and butter and a roof above them. There is something more to life. No? The caring and sharing has uh, begun and an inquiry, quest, who am I, what am I, what is life, what is spirit, these questions are coming. This indicates maturity in mind. So you think that the world is coming to a kind of maturity now, as opposed to breaking down, as many people would say. Yeah, I see. 
people are becoming more aware. I mean, it's a simultaneous process. On one side, people have seen so much violence, so much of hatred and this negativity, and they're fed up about it now, you know. I see that people are more and more interested in making themselves uh, to higher values. In America, there's a, a movement called um, uh, Basic Simplicity, or Back to Simplicity now. Um, it seems that this is part of uh, maybe this same kind of idea, where people are just fed up with so much of the material objects that it never really did give you satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, balance, of course, is absolutely essential balance. And the contentment and that that comes from deep within is what everyone is seeking for. There was a time, well, you can look out your window and see all the church steeples here in Amsterdam, in which it was, uh, at least it perceived itself as a religious place. And uh, now most of the churches are closed. Uh, fewer and fewer of the people are going to... Uh, is there an answer here in, in alternative forms of spirituality, different kinds of uh, spiritual pursuit at this point. Yeah, you know, there is a difference between religion and spirituality. Religion is like the banana skin. Spirituality is the banana, the substance, the value. In past decades, what had happened is, in centuries in fact, what had happened is people had thrown out the banana or just holding on to the skin. But now one realizes that we need not just rituals, or not just a mechanical something, but they want to do something from their heart, something authentic, something that can elevate their spirit. So it's quite but natural, people are sincere in looking for what they want. <laughs> I see so many New Age movements that are... I yesterday was in looking for a book about your, uh, your self and your group, and I, I found a very nice one, by the way. Um, it, it seems, yes, we're searching, but are we becoming more confused by all the... Uh, the different brands of, of this or that, or are they all somewhat the same? That is possible too. <laughs> In the eagerness to get something very quick, people may just go here and there and then there could be so many things. But it's your simplicity and your wisdom that always will bring you to the right place, right things. No, listening to your own consciousness. So you think people still are possessed of a kind of consciousness that they can find their own wisdom somehow? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. I, I, we're here making a television program at this point, and I think so much of the television has uh, demeaned the idea of, um, of searching. It, it has a tendency to not elevate, but, and so many people are plugged into it, as they would say, computers, television, but not into themselves. How do we reach people? these days? How do you reach people these days? I have not made much effort other than just traveling around wherever people uh, want us to spread. I see the best is word of mouth. People who got benefited, they tell their friends, look here, I got something out of this. Why don't you also do it? And you'll be happy. <laughs> you elevate yourself. And that's how we have been doing, mostly word of mouth. And then when there are already a group of people who have done the program, who have benefited, they want something further, some, you know, deeper insight, and uh, want to go deep into silence, then I go around and give some programs for them.
best is word of mouth that's what i see of course people can see in the media and they do get some idea out of it but nothing like hearing from a person who have been benefited i think that's what i always believe you know someone i know and trust and they yeah. say to me uh, boy this is something that really worked why don't you come join up or do you have a a s now coming from india i'm i'm just assuming now that you have a hindu background or is there a, or do you have a religious background uh, banana, <laughs> banana skin <laughs> of course yeah I have hindu background definitely i studied in a um, christian convent saint joseph school graduated from there so i have been always open to you know explore all different traditions of this world so i have uh, i consider all religions all traditions they emphasize on one value that is spirit now there seems to be some religious problems in india right now the hindus are attacking the christians i mean what is this because of the politics of the place or is it uh, do you, do you have any understanding about that you know for political gains so many things happen but uh, i don't think it's the basic uh, there is any conflict between hindus and christians in india as i have seen because in our own uh, set up there are many christian teachers there are many muslim teachers people who teach our programs and uh, they all come and sing hindu bhajans christians and hindus all sing christian songs they celebrate uh, christmas you know celebrate uh, different hindus are uh, allowed to celebrate you know christmas and same way christians do celebrate uh, hindu functions they do sing bhajans i think this is uh, more of a media exposure and political mileage people want to gain some political mileage they i don't see that there is such a big trouble or con conflict of course see the difficulty is the people are led by this uh, the the people who lead people to these things either the priests or uh, that sort of people the teachers and priests they have no idea about what exists in the other traditions say so any imam has no idea of what is in hindu tradition a hindu priest has no idea what is in bible or a christian priest has no idea about the wisdom that's in vedanta or in bhagavad gita and they are leading the people in many villages and towns or i mean around the world what i would recommend is if all these people who do the priest training school if they study other religious scriptures also even a little bit then they get an idea see the same truth is said everywhere then the mind becomes so open then they are able to own all the wisdom in the world as their own see see every religion has got three aspect one is the values and then uh, the practices and third is the symbols no val as far as the values are concerned there is no conflict the conflict is in practices and symbols and there could be diversity in practices and symbols as long as we understand the value is the same and i feel there is a dire need to educate these uh, religious leaders of this world to a wider arena of literatures of wisdom so that without bias they can accept you know and understand the wisdom that our planet is bestowed with there are some beautiful things in buddha's teachings and there are greatest wisdom in upanishads and there are such wonderful phrases in bible 
So why not all is made available to people who want to grow in their uh, in their spirit? That's uh, my question. I would uh, very much would like all the religious leader to have greater understanding. Then they won't provoke people to go far against uh, another human being. Now, one of the problems of the late 20th century is a huge exploitation of the planet itself. The environmental uh, catastrophes that we see happening around us. Is there a message about that? It's man's greed and lack of vision. Our environmental problem is lack of broader vision of human mind. And again, this comes back to educating our leaders. Huh? Also the public, the populace. But how do you tell somebody that has a, an automobile, or two automobiles, or three, that they have to give one up so that we save something? Huh? <laughs> you know, by someone telling it doesn't work, it has to come from within them. They had to realize, what do I do with three when I have to travel in only one? So that saturation has to come, that maturity has to come from within. And we can help them to go within, that's all we can do. <laughs> it seems in the third world now that, that they're trying to emulate the West, the great consumerism. I saw it in India that where people want to move from their scooter to a car or from this to that. Uh, it just doesn't seem that there's enough left to go around if we do it in the same way. Is there some way we can uh, reinstill different values here? You know, uh, someone who does not have a car, you cannot go and tell them, no, you should not have a car, you be with your cycle. It's okay, they can have their car, but see if they are contented, if they are happy. You'll find in India, you know, people, though they are poor, they smile. <laughs> For someone uh, from the West, uh, it's a little bit um, odd to see someone who is so poor, who lives in shackles, but still celebrate and coming and laughing and dancing. I see this is because of the spiritual atmosphere in that country, which has been there from ages, that there is an inner sense of sharing. Of course, it's disappearing in uh, urban areas, but if even today, if you go to rural areas, they may have food only for two days, but they would share it with you. There is a great sense of sharing. And I find the same uh, sense of sharing also in the farmer Soviet Union uh, countries, you know, farmer communist colonies, Belorussia and Poland. There's great sense of togetherness and sharing, belongingness in these countries. Of course, it's fast disappearing. That's why we had to quickly do something to restore the human values, tell people to look at life, look at the spirit, smile more, you know. <laughs> One thing that really struck me when I was in India is, like you say, there's a great deal of poverty, but at the same time, the children are so loved there. They, they, they laugh and, and play and have almost nothing. Here in the West, you see kind of a, a, a terseness with the children. Is, it, is this where we have to start, with the children? Yeah, children need uh, attention. They need that love, caring. I mean, in India also, in urban areas, it's becoming like here. It's becoming like here. That's what we need to share, what is good in every continent. There's something very nice in 
that continent something very nice here something very nice in the american continent something so beautiful in australia so we need to share these values from around the world today that need has come more than ever before because of the fast communication obviously Oftentimes today we feel under the threat of great catastrophe, either man-made, nuclear wars, and uh, what we saw recently in Iraq. Is there some way we can get beyond this nationalism, this uh, warlike menacing that we have from continent to continent? You know, first and foremost, we must know that we are part of one divine spirit, one divinity, one divine life. That sort we are all a part of. Second, we have we can have an identity as we are human beings. The third identity is we are male or female. The fourth identity, we belong to this country or that country. The fifth could be this religion or that religion. But when the order of identity reverses, when I first I think I belong to this religion or this country, then I am ready to give up my life. I am ready to give up my humanism, ready to give up my nature which is spirit for the sake of this small identification that we put on. Again, education, education is the only thing. There is nothing wrong in nationalism, but it needs to be a healthy nationalism. Nationalism should not uh, take over the humanism in us. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I say thank you very much for talking with me today, and uh, I've truly enjoyed it. Thank you for the honor. Thank you. Thank you. So there's this Values of human life Friendliness Compassion Naturalness Love Hmm. Attitude to do some service. Abhyas, abhyas, I better. Bara, bara, better. Hari, 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 Narayana.
or wear white dress, you can still be spiritual. This is just uniform, you know. <laughs> you know, when the police comes, they come in a uniform, then they are recognized as police. principle is accept people as they are. You cannot expect everyone to change overnight. So they will take their own time to change. Give them some space and you accept the situation as it is. First principle. Second principle, live in the present moment. We worry about the past, we are anxious about the future. Drop this tendency of the mind and come to the present moment. This is real prayer can happen when the mind is so deep in the present moment. Then you get connected to the source from which this life has come. affects a certain part of our body. For example, when you step on a thorn or in a stone, what happens? You say, ha! When you say, ha, where the sound is affecting? The navel region. And when you see something very astonishing, surprising, what do you say? Oh! Where is it affecting? the chest region. And when you find something very good, you say, Mmm! Oh, wonderful! Great! Mmm! Where is it affecting? The top part of our head. So each sound or syllable affects a definite part of our body, energizes it. Hmm? We'll do a meditation then. Hmm? Another deep breath in.
Let go all your efforts and just relax. Good, huh? Is it good? Is it good? Do you all enjoy the mind stretch? <laughs> huh? Yeah? really matter on what topic we speak. Ah. You know, you go to library, you have books on every topic there. Don't you? Hmm? And most of the questions we ask are from the topic which we already know. <laughs> Isn't that so? You know, we communicate more from our being, our whole, whole being, and so little through our words. Hmm? Isn't it? See, now you are saying yes. Are you saying yes? Or are you saying no? No, no, how that could be. Are you aware you are saying yes or no? This is very important. You can say no, but if you are aware you are saying no, there is a shift in consciousness. If you are saying yes and you are aware you are saying yes, there is a witness. That is most important. You ask a question and you hear an answer. The answer is supposed to create a yes in you, right? Yes? If you say no to an answer, that means it is not an answer. 
You ask me a question, I give an answer. If your mind says yes, that means you have accepted it as an answer. So the purpose of all answer is to create a yes. When you say yes, the energy in your brain is in the forefront region. When you say no, the energy is in the back region. That's why the questions are related to, more often related to problem. When you have a problem, you want to buy this problem to me. But the wonders are related to joy, pleasure, which is just opposite. You simply wonder, oh, how I wonder why this is so beautiful. You don't question why this is beautiful. Isn't so? Yes? <laughs> so why you are asking questions is to come to a state of mind which is Yes, and that is meditative mind. Meditative mind is what? A mind which has yes in it. Hmm? What do you say? <laughs> and that yes state of mind is the innocent mind, childlike mind. Simple mind. And this we have all had as a child. And now also you do have it. Everyone possesses that simple, innocent, positive mind. And we need to uncover it, dust it. That's lots of dust is sitting on it, just dust it. Okay, anyway, we'll look into some questions. Will I be able to find my way? I mean the right way. <laughs> this you will know when you reach the goal. <laughs> Only right way will take you to the goal. Now, I tell you, the moment you want to know that you are on the right way, you are already on the way. This very spirit of inquiry indicates you have started the journey. There are so many on this planet who simply exist, who do not even think about a path. Think about life, think about truth or reality. All that they do, they work from morning till evening, eat food and sleep and have spend time in front of televisions. Isn't that so? Hmm? You want to know who am I? What am I? What is this world? What is life? Billions of people have lived on this planet and they have gone and billions will come. This planet is existing since thousands and billions of years. And who am I? What am I? What do I want? What is life? What is truth? What is divinity? These questions have already put you on the way. Hmm? Don't doubt whether it is the right way or wrong way. Once you have this intention, the intensity to find truth, the way is right. Hmm? Also one more thing about doubt. Doubt is always about something that is positive. Have you noticed? 
when someone tells you, I love you so much, you ask them, really? <laughs> when someone tells you, I hate you, you don't ask them, really? <laughs> you doubt in the good quality of people, you never doubt in the bad quality of a person. You doubt in the honesty, never doubt in the dishonesty. You doubt your joy, your happiness. You never ever doubt your depression. I don't think you have ever said, well, I'm not sure if I'm depressed. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm sad. When you are unhappy, you are so sure about it. But when you are happy, say, well, I'm not sure, is this what I want? How many of you have said this? When you got the job which you wanted, when you got into a relationship which you liked, then you said, I'm not sure if this is what I want. How many of you have said, come on, come on, raise, raise your hands, look, look, look. <laughs> so our doubt is always about something, or most of the time about something that is positive. How to be happy in a world where so many people, for whatever reason, are unhappy? When you go deep inside, when you connect with the spirit that you are, with the divine spirit that is engulfing this whole creation, you know you are happiness. And then you will share that happiness with people around you, that is through service. You know, often people who do meditation or do some practices for themselves, they don't do service in the society. And people who are just doing service, they get so burnt out and depressed and, and lack of energy, they don't meditate. So we need a combination of both. Yeah? You meditate and be happy and spread that happiness around you to people who are unhappy. Yeah? Can you tell us something about things of life you are still struggling with and the way you are doing this? <laughs> I'm really struggling with the words. There are not enough words or right words in any language to express the inexpressible. To express something that everyone has but one is not able to find. Words appear to be so weak and any expression is not sufficient enough. And this has been the problem from ages, so it has no more become any struggle for me. <laughs> from time immemorial nobody could ever really say what they wanted to say. The same question came in front of Buddha once. I don't know whether you have heard this story. Have you heard a story about Buddha? <coughs> Buddha kept silent after his enlightenment, after his samadhi, for seven days. He did not say a word. 
And the mythological story goes, all the angels got so worried once in a long, long time, Buddha has come on the planet, he must speak something. So they all went to Buddha and asked him to say something. Buddha said, those who know, they will know. Those who do not know by my saying, they will not know. What is the point in speaking? I know, it says, another few more days, seven days passed, and the angels came back to him again. No, but there are some people who need just a little push, then your words can give a little push to them, and they will know. <laughs> so you can see, they persuaded Buddha. Have you heard this story? No? And it is true. What is wise to do when a relationship is broken up and I am left with a lump in my stomach, a closed heart and a lot of frustration and sadness? Do Sudarshan Kriya, this will help you. Pranayam, Sudarshan Kriya, meditation. This will take you out of all the past impressions. Hmm? Just wake up and see you leave before the relationship also and you will leave after that also. See your life from a bigger context. <coughs> Just imagine yourself to be very old or very young. I know this may be this may sound to be easy to hear, but in practical difficulty you may feel some sensation. For that, not just understanding, listening, reading books or tapes is sufficient. Practice is enough. This is through the breath, through the Kriya Sudarshan, you can really cleanse and get rid of those unpleasant feelings. Hmm? It has helped many, many, many people around the globe. So it can help you also. Is it possible to come to enlightenment by Christianity? What is Christianity? To realize God is love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And to have acceptance and patience and to be still and to know I am God. These are the basic principles of Christianity. So if you do any practice of meditation, yoga or anything, it is leading you to this realization you are love. Our love is God. Every religion has got three aspects. One is the values, other is symbols and practices. 
beliefs. Today what people have done is they have thrown the values out but just holding on to the symbol and practices out of fear or greed. People go to temple, church, mosque or anywhere only because of fear or greed. I mean most of the people. I tell you the true Christianity is common to the whole world. And anyone who comes to enlightenment will have to leave, will have to be a true Christian. Otherwise it's impossible. A Buddha is a true Christian. You think Buddha is not Christ? Buddha is Christ. Muhammad is Christ. Anyone who has attained that deep prayer, stillness, meditation, love, service, compassion, has attained that Christhood, Jesushood, Buddhahood, enlightenment. The path is not against any religion. At least that's how I see it. In fact, if you see all the rituals in Christianity, they are the same like in Hinduism too. They made a book especially saying all these rituals, every single rituals like incense, rosary, worship of Mother Mary, everything is like in Hinduism. Same thing. First and foremost know that you are human being and then it's fine, you are Christian. So what? You can still realize the divinity. You are a Buddhist, you can still realize the divinity. Yeah? You are a Jewish, you can still realize the divinity. Religion is just like the banana skin. Spirituality is the banana inside. I would rather go in for the banana. And can keep the skin also, no problem. <laughs> what is the time? Huh? 9.30? You can ask some question. Are you all feeling comfortable and free? Yeah? If you have some question, you can ask. <coughs> Is it ever possible to do too much meditation at once? recently said to me, like, you're doing way too much meditation, you will lose balance. Too much of anything is not good. Milk is good, but if you drink too much milk, it's no good. Meditation is good, but if you say, oh, I'm going to meditate for 20 hours or 15 hours, no good. That's why you need a, a teacher who tells you, okay, you can do for half an hour, maybe, Two hours, one hour, like that. Huh? Prescribed amount of this. Like taking shower is very good, but if someone says, I am going to take shower for five hours, <laughs> then your skin will all peel off. <laughs> right? There is a proverb in Sanskrit that says, Ati Sarvatra Varjit. Hmm? Too much of anything is not good.
How can I cope with a mind that is occupied with sex? What to do with violent people and unhappy people? How can we help? This is what I am all the time thinking. We do whatever way we can. Violent people, they need more love. You know who becomes violent? One who is weak. And one who feels weak becomes violent. A person does not know the strength that he has or she has, then they become violent. Make them aware how strong they are, you will see that the violence disappears. And it needs some skill to transform such people. Now we have been doing this program in many, many prisons around the world. Now, in U.S. alone, about seven to eight thousand people have done. In India, ten, fifteen thousand people. It's, it's an ongoing program. It's happening. We found such remarkable change in them. You know, the letters you get from the prisoners are something amazing. Hmm. It could be a beautiful story book. Very thrilling to read. <laughs> how their life, what it was, and what it has become. Yeah? If you read those books, if you read their experience, you will sit and cry. <laughs> Literally, you will cry at them. Is there a connection between human values and human rights? You know, right is in demanding, value is in nurturing. Value is from within you, right is somebody else have to give you the right. When you say human rights, you are demanding rights from somebody. Values is responsibility, what I can contribute to the society. Right says, what society can give it to me. They go hand in hand, unless and until we nurture human values, human rights cannot be protected. Impossible. Brainmachine is een apparaatje dat door middel van licht en geluid de frequentie van de hersengolven beïnvloedt.